Greetings and salutations, my fellow plebs. My name is Walker, and this is the Bitcoin Podcast. It's Monday, July 31st, 2023. The Bitcoin block height is 801077, and the value of one Bitcoin is still one Bitcoin. Today's episode is Bitcoin Out Loud, and I'm going to read you the book Anatomy of the State by Murray N. Rothbard. I believe everyone should read this book because so often people have difficulty understanding why Bitcoin is needed because they don't understand the extent of the problem, the extent of the state's overreach and predation. Anatomy of the State was published in 1974, but like any good book, the lessons are timeless and highly relevant today. Rothbard begins with the idea that the state is not a natural or voluntary organization, but rather a system that maintains its existence through coercive tax theft and a monopoly on violence. He argues that the state can never be considered neutral or benign, as its very existence relies on expropriating resources from the citizenry. As you listen, think about the fact that the state's monopoly on violence allows it to maintain its monopoly on money, and how Bitcoin is a direct challenge to that status quo. Without further ado, let's get into it. Anatomy of the State by Murray N. Rothbard The greatest danger to the state is independent intellectual criticism. What the state is not The state is almost universally considered an institution of social service. Some theorists venerate the state as the apotheosis of society. Others regard it as an amiable, though often inefficient, organization for achieving social ends. But almost all regard it as a necessary means for achieving the goals of mankind, a means to be ranged against the private sector, and often winning in this competition of resources. With the rise of democracy, the identification of the state with society has been redoubled, until it is common to hear sentiments expressed which violate virtually every tenet of reason and common sense, such as, we are the government. The useful collective term, we, has enabled an ideological camouflage to be thrown over the reality of political life. If we are the government, then anything a government does to an individual is not only just and untyrannical, but also voluntary on the part of the individual concerned. If the government has incurred a huge public debt, which must be paid by taxing one group for the benefit of another, the reality of this burden is obscured by saying that we owe it to ourselves. If the government conscripts a man or throws him into jail for dissident opinion, then he is doing it to himself, and therefore nothing untoward has occurred. Under this reasoning, any Jews murdered by the Nazi government were not murdered. Instead, they must have committed suicide, since they were the government, which was democratically chosen, and therefore anything the government did to them was voluntary on their part. One would not think it necessary to belabor this point, and yet the overwhelming bulk of people hold this fallacy to a greater or lesser degree. We must, therefore, emphasize that we are not the government. The government is not us. The government does not in any accurate sense represent the majority of the people. But even if it did, even if 70% of the people decided to murder the remaining 30%, this would still be murder and would not be voluntary suicide on the part of the slaughtered minority. No organicist metaphor, no irrelevant bromide that we are all part of one another must be permitted to obscure this basic fact. If, then, the state is not us, If it is not the human family getting together to decide mutual problems, if it is not a lodge meeting or country club, what is it? Briefly, the state is that organization in society which attempts to maintain a monopoly on the use of force and violence in a given territorial area. In particular, it is the only organization in society that obtains its revenue not by voluntary contribution or payment for services rendered, but by coercion, while other individuals or institutions obtain their income by production of goods and services 
and by the peaceful and voluntary sale of these goods and services to others. The state obtains its revenue by the use of compulsion, that is, by the use and the threat of the jailhouse and the bayonet. Having used force and violence to obtain its revenue, the state generally goes on to regulate and dictate the other actions of its individual subjects. One would think that simple observation of all states throughout history and over the globe would be proof enough of this assertion. But the miasma of myth has lain so long over state activity that elaboration is necessary. What the State Is Man is born naked into the world, and needing to use his mind to learn how to take the resources given him by nature, and to transform them, for example by investment in capital, into shapes and forms and places where the resources can be used for the satisfaction of his wants and the advancement of his standard of living. The only way by which man can do this is by the use of his mind and energy to transform resources, production, and to exchange these products for products created by others. Man has found that, through the process of voluntary mutual exchange, the productivity and hence the living standards of all participants in exchange may increase enormously. The only natural course for man to survive and to attain wealth, therefore, is by using his mind and energy to engage in the production and exchange process. He does this first by finding natural resources, and then by transforming them, by mixing his labor with them, as Locke puts it, to make them his individual property, and then by exchanging this property for the similarly obtained property of others. The social path dictated by the requirements of man's nature, therefore, is the path of property rights, and the free market of gift or exchange of such rights. Through this path, men have learned how to avoid the jungle methods of fighting over scarce resources, so that A can only acquire them at the expense of B, and instead to multiply those resources enormously in peaceful and harmonious production and exchange. The great German sociologist Franz Oppenheimer pointed out that there are two mutually exclusive ways of acquiring wealth. One, the above way of production and exchange, he called the economic means. The other way is simpler, in that it does not require productivity. It is the way of seizure of another's goods or services by the use of force and violence. This is the method of one-sided confiscation, of theft of the property of others. This is the method which Oppenheimer termed the political means to wealth. It should be clear that the peaceful use of reason and energy in production is the natural path for man, the means for his survival and prosperity on this earth. It should be equally clear that the coercive, exploitative means is contrary to natural law. It is parasitic, for instead of adding to production, it subtracts from it. The political means siphons production off to a parasitic and destructive individual or group and this siphoning not only subtracts from the number producing, but also lowers the producer's incentive to produce beyond his own substance. In the long run, the robber destroys his own substance by dwindling or eliminating the source of his own supply. But not only that, even in the short run, the predator is acting contrary to his own true nature as a man. We are now in a position to answer more fully the question, what is the state? The state, in the words of Oppenheimer, is the organization of the political means. It is the systemization of the predatory process over a given territory. For crime, at best, is sporadic and uncertain. The parasitism is ephemeral, and the coercive parasitic lifeline may be cut off at any time by the resistance of the victims. The state provides a legal, orderly, systematic channel for the predation of private property, it renders certain, secure, and relatively peaceful the lifetime of the parasitic caste in society. Since the production must always precede predation, the free market is anterior to the state. The state has never been created by a social contract. It has always been born in conquest and exploitation. The classic paradigm 
was a conquering tribe pausing in its time-honored method of looting and murdering a conquered tribe to realize that the time span of plunder would be longer and more secure, and the situation more pleasant, if the conquered tribe were allowed to live and produce, with the conquerors settling among them as rulers exacting a steady annual tribute. One method of the birth of a state may be illustrated as follows. In the hills of southern Ruritania, a bandit group manages to obtain physical control over the territory, and finally the bandit chieftain proclaims himself king of the sovereign and independent government of South Ruritania. And, if he and his men have the force to maintain this rule for a while, lo and behold, a new state has joined the family of nations, and the former bandit leaders have been transformed into the lawful nobility of the realm. How the state preserves itself. Once a state has been established, the problem of the ruling group, or caste, is how to maintain their rule. While force is their modus operandi, their basic and long-run problem is ideological. For in order to continue in office, any government, not simply a democratic government, must have the support of the majority of its subjects. This support, it must be noted, need not be active enthusiasm. It may well be passive resignation, as if to an inevitable law of nature. But support in the sense of acceptance of some sort it must be. Else the minority of state rulers would eventually be outweighed by the active resistance of the majority of the public. Since predation must be supported out of the surplus of production, it is necessarily true that the class constituting the state, the full-time bureaucracy, and nobility, must be a rather small minority in the land, although it may, of course, purchase allies among important groups in the population. Therefore, the chief task of the rulers is always to secure the active or resigned acceptance of the majority of the citizens. Of course, one method of securing support is through the creation of vested economic interests. Therefore, the king alone cannot rule he must have a sizable group of followers who enjoy the prerequisites of rule. For example, the members of the state apparatus, such as the full-time bureaucracy or the established nobility. But this still secures only a minority of eager supporters, and even the essential purchasing of support by subsidies and other grants of privilege still does not obtain the consent of the majority. For this essential acceptance, the majority must be persuaded by ideology that their government is good, wise, and, at least, inevitable, and certainly better than other conceivable alternatives. Promoting this ideology among the people is the vital social task of the intellectuals. For the masses of men do not create their own ideas, or indeed think through these ideas independently. They follow passively the ideas adopted and disseminated by the body of intellectuals. The intellectuals are, therefore, the opinion molders in society. And since it is precisely a molding of opinion that the state most desperately needs, the basis for age-old alliance between the state and the intellectuals becomes clear. It is evident that the state needs the intellectuals. It is not so evident why the intellectuals need the state. Put simply, we may state that the intellectual's livelihood in the free market is never too secure, for the intellectual must depend on the values and choices of the masses of his fellow men, and it is precisely characteristic of the masses that they are generally uninterested in intellectual matters. The state, on the other hand, is willing to offer the intellectuals a secure and permanent birth in the state apparatus, and thus a secure income and the panoply of prestige for the intellectuals will be handsomely rewarded for the important function they perform for the state rulers, of which group they now become a part. The alliance between the state and the intellectuals was symbolized in the eager desire of professors at the University of Berlin in the 19th century to form the intellectual bodyguard of the House of Hohenzollern. In the present day, let us note the revealing comment of an eminent Marxist scholar, 
concerning Professor Wittfogel's critical study of ancient Oriental despotism. The civilization which Professor Wittfogel is so bitterly attacking was one which could make poets and scholars into officials. Of innumerable examples, we may cite the recent development of the science of strategy in the service of the government's main violence-wielding arm, the military. A venerable institution, furthermore, is the official or court historian, dedicated to purveying the ruler's views of their own and their predecessors' actions. Many and varied have been the arguments by which the state and its intellectuals have induced their subjects to support their rule. Basically, the strands of argument may be summed up as follows. A. The state rulers are great and wise men. They rule by divine right. They are the aristocracy of men. They are the scientific experts, much greater and wiser than the good but rather simple subjects. And B. Rule by the extent government is inevitable, absolutely necessary, and far better than the indescribable evils that would ensue upon its downfall. The union of church and state was one of the oldest and most successful of these ideological devices. The ruler was either anointed by God, or, in the case of the absolute rule of many of the oriental despotisms, was himself God. Hence, any resistance to his rule would be blasphemy. The state's priestcraft performed the basic intellectual function of obtaining popular support and even worship for the rulers. Another successful device was to instill fear of any alternative systems of rule or non-rule. The present rulers, it was maintained, supply to the citizens an essential service for which they should be most grateful protection against sporadic criminals and marauders. For the state, to preserve its own monopoly of predation did indeed see to it that private and unsystematic crime was kept to a minimum. The state has always been jealous of its own preserve. Especially has the state been successful in recent centuries in instilling fear of the other state rulers. Since the land area of the globe has been parceled out among particular states, one of the basic doctrines of the state was to identify itself with the territory it governed. Since most men tend to love their homeland, the identification of that land and its people with the state was a means of making natural patriotism work to the state's advantage. If Ruritania was being attacked by Waldavia, the first task of the state and its intellectuals was to convince the people of Ruritania that the attack was really upon them and not simply upon the ruling caste. In this way, a war between rulers was converted into a war between peoples, with each people coming to the defense of its rulers in the erroneous belief that the rulers were defending them. This device of nationalism has only been successful in Western civilization in recent centuries. It was not too long ago that the mass of subjects regarded wars as irrelevant battles between various sets of nobles. Many and subtle are the ideological weapons that the state has wielded through the centuries. One excellent weapon has been tradition. The longer that the rule of a state has been able to preserve itself, the more powerful this weapon. For then, the X dynasty, or the Y state, has the seeming weight of centuries of tradition behind it. Worship of one's ancestors, then, becomes a none too subtle means of worship of one's ancient rulers. The greatest danger to the state is independent intellectual criticism. There is no better way to stifle that criticism than to attack any isolated voice, any raiser of new doubts, as a profane violator of the wisdom of his ancestors. Another potent ideological force is to deprecate the individual and exalt the collectivity of society. For since any given rule implies majority acceptance, any ideological danger to that rule can only start from one or a few independently thinking individuals. The new idea, much less the new critical idea, must needs begin as a small minority opinion. Therefore, the state must nip the view in the bud by ridiculing any view that defies the opinions of the mass.
listen only to your brothers, or adjust to society, thus became ideological weapons for crushing individual dissent. By such measures, the masses will never learn of the non-existence of their emperor's clothes. It is also important for the state to make its rule seem inevitable. Even if its reign is disliked, it will then be met with passive resignation, as witness the familiar coupling of death and taxes. One method is to induce historiographical determinism as opposed to individual freedom of will. If the X dynasty rules us, this is because the inexorable laws of history, or the divine will, or the absolute, or the material productive forces, have so decreed, and nothing any puny individual may do can change this inevitable decree. It is also important for the state to inculcate in its subjects an aversion to any conspiracy theory of history. For a search for conspiracies means a search for motives and an attribution of responsibility for historical misdeeds. If, however, any tyranny imposed by the state, or venality or aggressive war, was caused not by the state rulers, but by mysterious and arcane social forces, or by the imperfect state of the world, or, if in some way, everyone was responsible, we are all murderers, proclaims one slogan, then there is no point to the people becoming indignant or rising up against such misdeeds. Furthermore, an attack on conspiracy theories means that the subjects will become more gullible in believing the general welfare reasons that are always put forth by the state for engaging in any of its despotic actions. A conspiracy theory can unsettle the system by causing the public to doubt the state's ideological propaganda. Another tried-and-true method for bending subjects to the state's will is inducing guilt. Any increase in private well-being can be attacked as unconscionable greed, materialism, or excessive affluence. Profit-making can be attacked as exploitative and usury. Mutually beneficial exchanges denounced as selfishness and somehow with the conclusion always being drawn that more resources should be siphoned from the private to the public sector. The induced guilt makes the public more ready to do just that. For while individual persons tend to indulge in selfish greed, the failure of the state's rulers to engage in exchanges is supposed to signify their devotion to higher and nobler causes parasitic predation being apparently moral and aesthetically lofty as compared to peaceful and productive work. In the present more secular age, the divine right of the state has been supplemented by the invocation of a new god, science. State rule is now proclaimed as being ultra-scientific, as constituting planning by experts. But while reason is invoked more than in previous centuries, this is not the true reason of the individual and his exercise of free will. It is still collectivist and determinist, still implying holistic aggregates and coercive manipulation of passive subjects by their rulers. The increasing use of scientific jargon has permitted the state's intellectuals to weave obscurantist apologia for the state rule that would have only been met with derision by the populace of a simpler age. A robber who justifies his theft by saying that he really helped his victims, by his spending giving a boost to retail trade, would find few converts. But when this theory is clothed in Keynesian equations and impressive references to the multiplier effect, it unfortunately carries more conviction, and so the assault on common sense proceeds, each age performing the task in its own ways. Thus, ideological support being vital to the state, it must unceasingly try to impress the public with its legitimacy to distinguish its activities from those of mere brigands. The unremitting determination of its assaults on common sense is no accident, for as Menkel vividly maintained 
The average man, whatever his errors otherwise, at least sees clearly that the government is something lying outside him and outside the generality of his fellow men, that it is a separate, independent, and hostile power, only partly under his control and capable of doing him great harm. Is it a fact of no significance that robbing the government is everywhere regarded as a crime of less magnitude than robbing an individual or even a corporation? What lies behind all this, I believe, is a deep sense of the fundamental antagonism between the government and the people it governs. It is apprehended, not as a committee of citizens chosen to carry on a communal business of the whole population, but as a separate and autonomous corporation, mainly devoted to exploiting the population for the benefit of its own members. When a private citizen is robbed, a worthy man is deprived of the fruits of his industry and thrift. When the government is robbed, the worst that happens is that certain rogues and loafers may have less money to play with than they had before. The notion that they have earned that money is never entertained. To most sensible men, it would seem ludicrous. How the State Transcends Its Limits As Bertrand de Juvenel has sagely pointed out, through the centuries men have formed concepts desired to check and limit the exercise of state rule. And, one after another, the state, using its intellectual allies, has been able to transform these concepts into intellectual rubber stamps of legitimacy and virtue to attach to its decrees and actions. Originally, in Western Europe, the concept of divine sovereignty held that the kings may rule only according to divine laws. The kings turned the concept into a rubber stamp of divine approval for any of the king's actions. The concept of parliamentary democracy began as a popular check upon the absolute monarchical rule. It ended with parliament being the essential part of the state and its every act totally sovereign. As de Juvenel concludes, Many writers on theories of sovereignty have worked out one of these restrictive devices. But in the end, every single such theory has, sooner or later, lost its original purpose, and come to act merely as a springboard to power, by providing it with the powerful aid of an invisible sovereign with whom it could in time successfully identify itself. Similarly with more specific doctrines, the natural rights of the individual enshrined in John Locke and the Bill of Rights became a statist right to a job. Utilitarianism turned from arguments for liberty to arguments against resisting the state's invasions of liberty, etc. Certainly the most ambitious attempt to impose limits on the state has been the Bill of Rights and other restrictive parts of the American Constitution, in which written limits on government became the fundamental law to be interpreted by a judiciary supposedly independent of the other branches of government. All Americans are familiar with the process by which the construction of limits in the Constitution has been inexorably broadened over the last century. But few have been as keen as Professor Charles Black to see that the state has, in the process, largely transformed judicial review itself from a limiting device to yet another instrument for furnishing ideological legitimacy to the government's actions. For if a judicial decree of unconstitutional is a mighty check to government power, an implicit or explicit verdict of constitutional is a mighty weapon for fostering public acceptance of even greater government power. Professor Black begins his analysis by pointing out that the crucial necessity of legitimacy for any government to endure this legitimation signifying basic majority acceptance of the government and its actions. Acceptance of legitimacy becomes a particular problem in a country such as the United States, where substantive limitations are built into the theory on which the government rests. What is needed, adds Black, is a means by which the government can assure the public that its increasing powers are indeed constitutional, and this, he concludes, has been the major historical function of judicial review. Let Black illustrate the problem. 
The supreme risk to the government is that of disaffection and a feeling of outrage widely disseminated throughout the population, and loss of moral authority by the government as such, however long it may be propped up by force or inertia or the lack of an appealing and immediately available alternative. Almost everybody living under a government of limited powers must sooner or later be subjected to some governmental action which, as a matter of private opinion, he regards as outside the power of government or positively forbidden to government. A man is drafted, though he finds nothing in the Constitution about being drafted. A farmer is told how much wheat he can raise. He believes, and he discovers, that some respectable lawyers believe with him that the government has no more right to tell him how much wheat he can grow than it has to tell his daughter whom she can marry. A man goes to the federal penitentiary for saying what he wants to, and he paces his cell, reciting, Congress shall make no laws abridging the freedom of speech. A businessman is told what he can ask, and must ask, for buttermilk. The danger is real enough that each of these people, and who is not of their number, will confront the concept of government limitation with the reality, as he sees it, of the flagrant overstepping of actual limits, and draw the obvious conclusion as to the status of his government with respect to its legitimacy. This danger is averted by the states propounding the doctrine that one agency must have the ultimate decision on constitutionality, and that this agency, in the last analysis, must be part of the federal government. For while the seeming independence of the federal judiciary has played a vital part in making its actions virtual holy writ for the bulk of the people, it is also and ever true that the judiciary is part and parcel of the government apparatus and appointed by the executive and legislative branches. Black admits that this means the state has set itself up as a judge in its own cause, thus violating a basic juridical principle for aiming at just decisions. He brusquely denies the possibility of any alternative. Black adds, The problem, then, is to devise such a governmental means of deciding as will, hopefully, reduce to a tolerable minimum the intensity of the objection that government is judge in its own cause. Having done this, you can only hope that this objection, though theoretically still tenable, will practically lose enough of its force that legitimating work of the deciding institution can win acceptance. In the last analysis, Black finds the achievement of justice and legitimacy from the state's perpetual judging of its own cause as something of a miracle. Applying his thesis to the famous conflict between the Supreme Court and the New Deal, Professor Black keenly chides his fellow pro-New Deal colleagues for their short-sightedness in denouncing judicial obstruction. The standard version of the story of the New Deal in the court, though accurate in its way, displaces the emphasis. It concentrates on the difficulties. It almost forgets how the whole thing turned out. The upshot of the matter was, and this is what I like to emphasize, that after some 24 months of balking, the Supreme Court, without a single change in the law of its composition or indeed in its actual manning, placed the affirmative stamp of legitimacy on the New Deal and on the whole new conception of government in America. In this way, the Supreme Court was able to put the quietus on the large body of Americans who had had strong constitutional objections to the New Deal. Of course, not everyone was satisfied. The Bonnie Prince Charlie of constitutionally commanded laissez-faire still stirs the hearts of a few zealots in the highlands of choleric unreality. But there is no longer any significant or dangerous public doubt as to the constitutional power of Congress to deal as it does with the national economy. We had no means, other than the Supreme Court, for imparting legitimacy to the New Deal. As Black recognizes, one major political theorist who recognized, and largely in advance, the glaring loophole in a constitutional limit on government of placing the ultimate interpreting power in the Supreme Court was John C. Calhoun. Calhoun was not content with the miracle but instead proceeded to a profound analysis of the constitutional problem. In his Disquisition, Calhoun demonstrated that the inherent tendency of the state to break through the limits of such a constitution, 
A written constitution certainly has many considerable advantages, but it is a great mistake to suppose that the mere insertion of provisions to restrict and limit the power of the government, without investing those for whose protection they are inserted, with the means of enforcing their observance, will be sufficient to prevent the major and dominant party from abusing its powers. Being the party in possession of the government, they will, from the same constitution of man which makes government necessary to protect society, be in favor of the powers granted by the constitution and opposed to the restrictions intended to limit them. The minor or weaker party, on the contrary, would take the opposite direction and regard them, the restrictions, as essential to the protection against the dominant party. But where there are no means by which they could compel the major party to observe the restrictions, the only resort left to them would be a strict construction of the Constitution. To this, the major party would oppose a liberal construction. It would be construction against construction, the one to contract and the other to enlarge the powers of the government to the utmost. But of what possible avail could the strict construction of the minor party be against the liberal construction of the major, when the one who would have all the power of the government to carry its construction into effect, and the other be deprived of all means of enforcing its construction. In a contest so unequal, the result would not be doubtful. The party in favor of the restrictions would be overpowered. The end of the contest would be the subversion of the Constitution. The restrictions would ultimately be annulled, and the government be converted into one of unlimited powers. One of the few political scientists who appreciated Calhoun's analysis of the Constitution was Professor J. Allen Smith. Smith noted that the Constitution was designed with checks and balances to limit any one governmental power, and yet had then developed a Supreme Court with the monopoly of ultimate interpretating power. If the federal government was created to check invasions of individual liberty by the separate states, who was to check the federal power? Smith maintained that implicit in the check and balance idea of the Constitution was a concomitant view that no one branch of government may be conceded the ultimate power of interpretation. It was assumed by the people that the new government could not be permitted to determine the limits of its own authority, since this would make it, and not the Constitution, supreme. The solution advanced by Calhoun and seconded in this century by such writers as Smith was, of course, the famous doctrine of the concurrent majority. If any substantial minority interest in the country, specifically a state government, believed that the federal government was exceeding its powers and encroaching on that minority, the minority would have the right to veto this exercise of power as unconstitutional. Applied to state governments, this theory implied the right of nullification of a federal law or ruling within a state's jurisdiction. In theory, the ensuing constitutional system would assure that the federal government check any state invasion of individual rights, while the states would check excessive federal power over the individual. And yet, while limitations would undoubtedly be more effective than at present, there are many difficulties and problems in the Calhoun solution. If indeed a subordinate interest should rightfully have a veto over matters concerning it, then why stop with the states? Why not place veto power in counties, cities, wards? Furthermore, Interests are not only sectional, they are also occupational, social, etc. What of bakers or taxi drivers or any other occupation? Should they not be permitted a veto power over their own lives? This brings us to the important point that the nullification theory confines its checks to agencies of government itself. Let us not forget that the federal and state governments and their respective branches are still states, are still guided by their own state interests rather than the interests of the private citizens. What is to prevent the Calhoun system from working in reverse, with states tyrannizing over their citizens and only vetoing the federal government when it tries to intervene to stop that state tyranny, or for states to acquiesce in federal tyranny? What is to prevent federal and state governments from forming mutually profitable alliances for the joint exploitation of the citizenry. And even if the private occupational groupings were to be given some form of functional representation in government, 
What is to prevent them from using the state to gain subsidies and other special privileges for themselves or for imposing compulsory cartels on their own members? In short, Calhoun does not push his path-breaking theory on concurrence far enough. He does not push it down to the individual himself. If the individual, after all, is the one whose rights are to be protected, then a consistent theory of concurrence would imply veto power by every individual. That is, some form of unanimity principle. When Calhoun wrote that it should be impossible to put or keep it, the government, in action without the concurrent consent of all, he was, perhaps, unwittingly implying just such a conclusion. But such speculation begins to take us away from our subject. For down this path lie political systems which could hardly be called states at all. For one thing, just as the right of nullification for a state logically implies its right of secession, so a right of individual nullification would imply the right of any individual to secede from the state under which he lives. Thus, the state has invariably shown a striking talent for the expansion of its powers beyond any limits that might be opposed upon it. Since the state necessarily lives by the compulsory confiscation of private capital, and since its expansion necessarily involves ever greater incursions on private individuals and private enterprise, we must assert that the state is profoundly and inherently anti-capitalist. In a sense, our position is the reverse of the Marxist dictum that the state is the executive committee of the ruling class in the present day, supposedly the capitalists. Instead, the state, the organization of the political means, constitutes and is the source of the ruling class, rather ruling caste, and is in permanent opposition to genuinely private capital. We may, therefore, say with de Juvenel, only those who know nothing of any time but their own, who are completely in the dark as to the manner of powers behaving throughout thousands of years, would regard these proceedings, nationalization, the income tax, etc., as the fruit of a particular set of doctrines. They are, in fact, the normal manifestations of power, and differ not at all in their nature from Henry VIII's confiscation of the monasteries. The same principle is at work. The hunger for authority, the thirst for resources, and in all of these operations the same characteristics are present, including the rapid elevation of the dividers of the spoils, whether it is socialist or whether it is not, power must always be at war with the capitalist authorities and despoil the capitalists of their accumulated wealth. In doing so, it obeys the law of its nature. What the State Fears What the State fears above all, of course, is any fundamental threat to its own power and its own existence. The death of a state can come about in two major ways. A. Through conquest by another state. Or B. Through revolutionary overthrow by its own subjects. In short, by war or revolution. War and revolution, as the two basic threats, invariably arouse in the state rulers their maximum efforts and maximum propaganda among the people. As stated above, any way must always be used to mobilize the people to come to the state's defense in the belief that they are defending themselves. The fallacy of the idea becomes evident when conscription is wielded against those who refuse to defend themselves and are, therefore, forced into joining the state's military band. Needless to add, no defense is permitted them against this act of their own state. In war, State power is pushed to its ultimate, and, under the slogans of defense and emergency, it can impose a tyranny upon the public, such as might be openly resisted in time of peace. War thus provides many benefits to a state, and indeed, every modern war has brought to the warring peoples a permanent legacy of increased state burdens upon a society. War, moreover, 
provides to a state tempting opportunities for conquest of land areas over which it may exercise its monopoly of force. Randolph Bourne was certainly correct when he wrote that war is the health of the state. But to any particular state, a war may spell either health or grave injury. We may test the hypothesis that the state is largely interested in protecting itself rather than its subjects by asking, which category of crimes does the state pursue and punish most intensely, those against private citizens or those against itself? The gravest crimes in the state's lexicon are almost invariably not invasions of private person or property, but dangers to its own contentment, for example, treason, desertion of a soldier to the enemy, failure to register for the draft, subversion and subversive conspiracy, assassination of rulers and such economic crimes against the state as counterfeiting its money or evasion of income tax. Or compare the degree of zeal devoted to pursuing the man who assaults a policeman, with the attention that the state pays to the assault of an ordinary citizen. Yet, curiously, the state's openly assigned priority to its own defense against the public strikes few people as inconsistent with its presumed raison d'etre. How States Relate to One Another since the territorial area of the earth is divided among different states, interstate relations must occupy much of a state's time and energy. The natural tendency of a state is to expand its power, and externally such expansion takes place by conquest of a territorial area. Unless a territory is stateless or uninhabited, any such expansion involves an inherent conflict of interest between one set of state's rulers and another. Only one set of rulers can obtain a monopoly of coercion over any given territorial area at any one time. Complete power over a territory by State X can only be obtained by the expulsion of State Y. War, while risky, will be an ever-present tendency of states, punctuated by periods of peace and by shifting alliances and coalitions between states. We have seen that the internal or domestic attempt to limit the state in the 17th through 19th centuries reached its most notable form in constitutionalism. Its external or foreign affairs counterpart was the development of international law, especially such forms as the law of war and the neutral rights. Parts of international law were originally purely private, growing out of the need of merchants and traders everywhere to protect their property and adjudicate disputes. Examples are admiralty law and the law merchant. But even the governmental rules emerged voluntarily and were not imposed by any international superstate. The object of the laws of war was to limit interstate destruction to the state apparatus itself, thereby preserving the innocent civilian public from the slaughter and devastation of war. The object of the development of neutrals' rights was to preserve private civilian international commerce, even with enemy countries, from seizure by one of the warring parties. The overriding aim, then, was to limit the extent of any war, and particularly to limit its destructive impact on the private citizens of the neutral and even warring countries. The jurist F.J.P. Veal charmingly describes such civilized warfare as it briefly flourished in 15th century Italy. The rich burghers and merchants of medieval Italy were too busy making money and enjoying life to undertake the hardships and dangers of soldiering themselves, so they adopted the practice of hiring mercenaries to do their fighting for them, and, being thrifty, business-like folk, they dismissed their mercenaries immediately after their services could be dispensed with. Wars were, therefore, fought by armies hired for each campaign. For the first time, Soldiering became a reasonable and comparatively harmless profession. The generals of that period maneuvered against each other, often with consummate skill, but when one had won the advantage, his opponent generally either retreated or surrendered. It was a recognized rule that a town could only be sacked if it offered resistance. Immunity could always be purchased by paying a ransom. As one natural consequence, 
no town ever resisted, it being obvious that a government too weak to defend its citizens had forfeited their allegiance. Civilians had little to fear from the dangers of war, which were the concern only of professional soldiers. The well-nigh absolute separation of the private civilian from the state's wars in 18th century Europe is highlighted by Neff. Even postal communications were not successfully restricted for long in wartime. Letters circulated without censorship, with a freedom that astonishes the 20th century mind. The subjects of two warring nations talked to each other if they met, and when they could not meet, corresponded, not as enemies, but as friends. The modern notion hardly existed that subjects of any enemy country are partly accountable for the belligerent act of their rulers. Nor had the warring rulers any firm disposition to stop communications with subjects of the enemy. The old inquisitorial practices of espionage in connection with religious worship and belief were disappearing, and no comparable inquisition in connection with political or economic communications was even contemplated. Passports were originally created to provide safe conduct in time of war. During most of the 18th century, it seldom occurred to Europeans to abandon their travels in a foreign country, which their own was fighting. And trade being increasingly recognized as beneficial to both parties, 18th century warfare also counterbalances a considerable amount of trading with the enemy. How far states have transcended rules of civilized warfare in this century needs no elaboration here. In the modern era of total war, combined with the technology of total destruction, the very idea of keeping war limited to the state apparati seems even more quaint and obsolete than the original Constitution of the United States. When states are not at war, agreements are often necessary to keep frictions at a minimum. One doctrine that has gained curiously wide acceptance is the alleged sanctity of treaties. This concept is treated as the counterpart of the sanctity of contract, but a treaty and a genuine contract have nothing in common. A contract transfers, in a precise manner, titles to private property. Since a government does not, in any proper sense, own its territorial area, any agreements that it concludes do not confer titles to property. If, for example, Mr. Jones sells or gives his land to Mr. Smith, Jones's heir cannot legitimately descend upon Smith's heir and claim the land as rightfully his. The property title has already been transferred. Old Jones's contract is automatically binding upon young Jones. Because the former had already transferred the property, young Jones, therefore, has no property claim. Young Jones can only claim that which he has inherited from old Jones and old Jones can only bequeath property which he still owns. But if, at a certain date, the government of, say, Ruritania, is coerced or even bribed by the government of Waldavia into giving up some of its territory, it is absurd to claim that the governments or inhabitants of the two countries are forever barred from a claim to reunification of Ruritania on the grounds of the sanctity of a treaty. Neither the people nor the land of northwest Ruritania are owned by either of the two governments. As a corollary, one government can certainly not bind by the dead hand of the past, a later government through treaty. A revolutionary government which overthrew the king of Ruritania could, similarly, hardly be called to account for the king's actions or debts, for a government is not, as is a child, a true heir to its predecessor's property. History as a Race Between State Power and Social Power Just as the two basic and mutually exclusive interrelations between men are peaceful cooperation or coercive exploitation, production or predation, so the history of mankind, particularly its economic history, may be considered as a contest between these two principles. On the one hand, there is creative productivity, peaceful exchange, and cooperation on the other, coercive dictation and predation over those social relations. Albert J. Nock happily termed these contesting forces social power and state power. Social power is man's power over nature 
his cooperative transformation of nature's resources and insight into nature's laws, for the benefit of all participating individuals. Social power is the power over nature, the living standards achieved by men in mutual exchange. State power, as we have seen, is the coercive and parasitic seizure of this production, a draining of the fruits of society for the benefit of non-productive, actually anti-productive, rulers. While social power is power over nature, state power is power over man. Through history, man's productive and creative forces have, time and time again, carved out new ways of transforming nature for man's benefit. These have been the times when social power has spurted ahead of state power, and when the degree of state encroachment over society has considerably lessened. But always, after a greater or smaller time lag, the state has moved into these new areas to cripple and confiscate social power once more. If the 17th through 19th centuries were, in many countries of the West, times of accelerating social power, and a corollary increase in freedom, peace, and material welfare. The 20th century has been primarily an age in which state power has been catching up, with a consequent reversion to slavery, war, and destruction. In this century, the human race faces, once again, the virulent reign of the state, of the state now armed with the fruits of man's creative powers, confiscated and perverted to its own aims. The last few centuries were times when men tried to place constitutional and other limits on the state, only to find that such limits, as with all other attempts, have failed. Of all the numerous forms that governments have taken over the centuries, of all the concepts and institutions that have been tried, none has succeeded in keeping the state in check. The problem of the state is evidently as far from solution as ever. Perhaps new paths of inquiry must be explored if the successful final solution of the state question is ever to be attained. And that's a wrap on this Bitcoin Out Loud episode of The Bitcoin Podcast. You can listen to all the episodes at bitcoinpodcast.net they are available wherever you get your podcasts. You can find me on Noster by going to primal.net slash walker. If you want to follow The Bitcoin Podcast on Twitter, go to at Titcoin Podcast and at Walker America. You can also find the video version of this and all the other shows at youtube.com slash at Walker America. Bitcoin is scarce. There will only ever be 21 million. But Bitcoin podcasts are abundant. So thank you for spending your scarce time to listen to another fucking Bitcoin podcast. Until next time, stay free.